What's up? It's the Blastmaster KRS One, and of course I'm chilling. You're tuned in right now to Don't Believe the Hype, and you know the rules: Don't believe the hype. Peace. Here we come, here we come, yeah. Don't believe the hype. Come, y'all. It's don't believe the hype. Racket stereotypes handling situations that young folks are facing. We hunt down the truth like detectives, selective, making sure the knowledge is effective. Yeah. Don't, don't So lounge and check the mad videos and discussion Common sense busting out of your brain Because advancement is the name of the game Don't believe the hype, y'all don't believe the hype Bring your knowledge, wisdom, and understanding Hand in hand, so now you know Let's check out the show Here we go, here we go Can there really be justice on stolen land? Can there really be justice for stolen people On stolen land? Questions to ponder upon as you think about justice. Hey, what's up? My name is Danny. And my name is Mark D, and you're tuned in to Don't Believe the Hype, a show created by, for, and about the hip-hop nation. It's been about a year since the L.A. uprising, and tonight we're going to talk about justice. Are community police relations just? Are we just with one another? So we'll start by taking a look at Ice-T's tribute to the whole gang truce. It was over 15,000 gang members right, throughout the city. Love. was right out right here every night for over like two months. It ain't, it ain't been a time like this where motherfuckers roll and go where you want to go without having to worry about getting blasted or whatever. I mean, motherfuckers can come, come wherever you want to come unstrapped, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't no atmosphere. Violence was, it was an atmosphere like disbelief. How it's like, feel? like the OJs put it back in the days. It's a family reunion. Woke up the other morning. I heard a rumor. They said the gang wars was over. I told them they were straight tripping. They said it's real as hell. Can't explain the way I felt. Too many years I seen my brothers die. And I can't say that it was really that fly, but I used to gang bang when I was younger. So it's really hard to tell a kid that he's going under. I never thought I'd live to see us chill. Crips and bloods holding hands, admit it's ill. But I love it, I can't help it. Too much depth on the streets and we dealt it. Van S boys, the Hoovers, the 60s, bounty hunters, eight trades, all cooling out, G. I pray that this will never stop. You used to see the wrong colors in the gaps when pop, pop. But now the kids got a chance to live. And the OG's got something to give. That's love black on black. That's how they made it. And if any buses flip, they get faded. LA is where I'm speaking of. Peace to all the gangsters. Cause I got a lot of love. Cause I remember nights when they was on rules with Uzi and waiting for got a Now lot of love. you can walk. You can, you you can go can anywhere. Walk. You can go anywhere now. Love. Has any of y'all had any, any relatives? Uh, me, my cousin got killed. I'm talking about giving our streets back to our mothers and our kids so they could chill, so they could live, so they could play in the playground, so they ain't gotta be worrying about no bullets. I got a lot of love cause you're all my brothers. Red or blue, black's the color. We got a chance so we can really sweat the real fools. Show those punk suckers the real tools. Check the enemy. It ain't the family. Not 111. Try LAPD. They got to understand you beat on a black man. It's going to be drama. Know what I'm saying? And if we flip, let's all flip together. Because I'm prepared, kid, for rough weather. And we got to realize the boys on the east side. You call them essays? I call them allies. Because the day that we all unite. Watch the pigs get real polite. Them punk suckers gotta learn quick that we ain't taking no more sh. LA is where I'm speaking of. Peace to all the gangsters, cause I got a lot of love. We don't have to worry about no drive-bys. We don't have to worry about nobody getting hurt. Crenshaw Boulevard, Sunday afternoon, folks sitting on things, mad systems, boom. The girls are looking better. The gang truce is on, so you wear whatever. At Venice by the ocean, ragtop tray hits the three-wheel motion. There's gangsters all around. Still crazy sets, but you just don't clown. I pray a lake can stay this way. It's the first summer I can really say. I felt cool. We all chill. Went to the park and nobody got killed. Now if you got a problem, it's man on man. You don't need a gang to solve them. I seen the greatest thing I seen in my life. Two brothers in a straight up fist fight. Nobody pulled a gat, nobody jumped in. Nobody pulled a knife, nobody got done in. LA is where I'm speaking of. Peace to my city, cause I got a lot of love. 
It's cool that everybody come together and stop the killing. Where when a motherfucker see a car or see a cat, mother wanted to run and duck and die in, in, in the house or nothing. Listen to the people in this community. They have shown that they can bring peace, they can bring justice, they can change their community, we can change the world. Yeah, I see ET is on the MIC, and I'm totally down with the true G. Cause now we're on a totally different tip. No more pig brutality shit. This unity is getting to me. Every brother on the street is my homie. I'm rolling through a hood that I've never been. And every brother steps to me as a friend. I love it. I love it. And nothing in my life will ever be above it. We want to see our kids all grown up. We're tired of seeing our hoods get blown up. L.A. is a great place. Fly girls, dope cars, life at a fast pace. But gang banging was killing it quick. Another child got hit. Bullshit. Pop, 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 10 on a weekend. We was going off the deep end. But now we got a chance, my friend, to mend and make the colors blend. Let's all go out on a picnic, kick it, and squash all the static. Last year, I lost about five homies. This thing is real to me. L.A. is where I'm speaking of. Peace to all the gangsters, because I got a lot of love. Cause you know you had like family members, family members from different from different hoods, but they couldn't interact with each other because one may have been a blood and one may have been a crip. But uh, I'm really speaking today because uh, not only for my community but for my son. He's in jail. He got 20 years. Okay, for a job, drive by shooting. Okay, now, he's 16. And he can't believe that everybody's calling himself getting together and stuff. My baby is gone. I'm quit gangbang for the better for all the people. I'm talking about killing and doing drive-bys. I'm talking about letting people live. I lay down my gun, you know what I mean? Lay down my rag. If you look and y'all cameras is focused on what you see, this is the truth right here. If we are equal, anything can happen. The peace now has held now for six months. We must have justice now. All I can think about is what can we do now to pull ourselves and our families together so that we can really help ourselves. You ain't going to be red. You ain't going to be blue. You ain't going to be green. But we all gonna be black people. They gotta stand up to their word. They gotta come on with it, cause our words are fine. We can do this. The truce in LA is definitely in effect in Watts and is spreading across the country between black and Latino gangs. However, there's still an incredible amount of violence in our community, and I wanna know why is that? Throwing that to Shireen. Well, one of the th reasons why I think it is First, I want to state that me being from Tennessee, I was born and raised there, and then I moved here to what I call the city, St. Paul, Minnesota, was very different for me because I noticed there were a lot of people kind of crowded. It may not be, the city may not be as crowded as a city of, like opposed to New York or something like that, but it was crowded to me, and I saw a lot of, you know, people trying to get over on one another um, to get something what people call the American dream. And I mean, I don't, I don't see why, you know, it seems like money is what everybody's after, money. They want it right now, here and now, rather than to go get, you know, what they need to get in order to make that money legally, yeah. you know. And that's just one of the reasons why I see that there's black on black crime, um, specifically, is that people are living on top of one another. And they're after, the, everybody's after this American dream that's been idolized, you know. I think America in a whole is having a problem with this money trip. That's why we're like on the bottom of everything. We're in debt to whoever, you know, forever, basically, you know what I'm saying? And See, but you know what, that's, that's what they'd like us to believe. You know, um, really, African people in America have the resources to be like the seventh biggest country in this world. But yet they'll tell you that, hey, you know, go down on the corner, get your 40, you know, go shoot your man. That's what we're seeing out here. And there's a lot of violence, you know, not just us, but everybody plays into violence in the movies, violence on television, violence in music, whatever it may be. You know, but we put that, that low self-esteem and that miseducation, that is what we really got, you know, out here. And then next thing you know, somebody you know is dead on the street. You know, we have such, such low esteem that, hey, it's nothing to go out and shoot your man. Well, you guys are talking so much about, you know, 
all this this stuff is making me depressed i don't know about y'all but how are you guys gonna go about changing this stuff you know what are you guys gonna do go back in your community and do you know it's more than just you know night moves it's more than just all this this other stuff you know because after night moves is over where are them people going you know they're going right back out there on the streets and they're doing them same things that they were gonna do you know that while they was at night moves so what are we gonna do right after that's over you know well, well, I'll say, I'm sorry about that. Well, I'll, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. All I can say is that uh, we're just giving them the choice, you know, the good decision to make, and it's up to them to make it. You know, we can't mm -hmm. be, you know, their parents. We can't, you know, force them to do it, you know. There's always going to be I know that. Bad. I know that. I'm just right. saying. You know? But I think that any program that improves our self-esteem will help somebody make that choice to not be out there killing somebody else because they, they love themselves and they can love one another. I see and I think saying. that that's important. Because, you know, you know these, these programs are cool, but when it comes down to it, where's the money going to come from? You know, that's what, that's what brothers be saying, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. When it comes to, you know, you can play ball all you want, but after that, you got to make some money because you got to pay bills. Yeah. You know, you got to eat. Mm -hmm. And if you have children, you have to feed your children, you know? And everybody doesn't have a college degree. Everybody doesn't have a high school diploma. You know what I'm saying? Brothers just do what they got to do. It most times it's selling drugs. You know. Some, and sometimes yeah. in some cases, you know, sometimes they go out for jobs and they could have their college degree or whatever, but their parents is not going to get them that job. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. What I seen, you know, like speaking from night moves, you know, they put this one person in the spotlight for a long, for a while, you know, and it was all cool, you know. He was talking about his life and how he had got off the street and everything and everything like that. He was in the spotlight, but then again, I seen him right back out there on the streets doing the same thing. But he said he was gonna, you know, try and, uh, you know, work things out and everything. But, you know, that, that didn't happen. That's not reality. That's not what really happened. We need to think beyond, you know, what are we gonna do outside them programs? You know, I see them people down the street. Maybe I should have went up to them and, you know, had a little talk to them, but, you know, you know. Well, we, well, we, look, we look at this, you know, yeah, because that is reality. I, I was checking that out. But at the same time, you know, everything starts with self. You know, hey, we, you, we can have all the, you know, all the programs in the world, one right after another, you know. And if, you, if you're not willing to, to, to get out here for yourself, if you don't have your own priorities together and your own morality together, then hey, you know, it's like at the same time, you know, I worry about that brother. I know the brother you're talking about. I worry about him, but at the same time, I know that I gotta do what I gotta do, and that means doing what I do, like being at night moves, like going and just speaking to, to young people on the street. You know, really, you know, hey, that, that can remedize a lot of things that if we just talk to one another. Change. You know, we don't even have communication anymore. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the key things that we have to get back to is communication. So. I think we have to start becoming our own role models because there's not, there doesn't seem to be any more like Malcolm X's or Dr. King's around for us right now because it's like all of the people that they put in the limelight turn out to be somebody else once the cameras are off. So I think that it's time that we just come up and be our own role models. But anyway, let's hear from rap artist Daddy O and from you through the Hype Video Crew. With all the gang violence and all the drive-by shootings and all the things that were going on in L.A., I don't know, it was almost as if the system thought, you know, they're just a bunch of ignorant people that do the crab in the barrel fight. But I think the system needs to understand that we're talking about a bunch of young people who are really sick and tired of nonsense. Yeah, they're too strict and uh, they harass young people just for no apparent reason. Not all cops, but a lot of them. In some ways, I think they're against us because of some of the type of stuff that they do, but some cops give other cops a bad rap. In a lot of ways, they're, they're down for us, I think. In my community where I live, I think they're against me. There's crime, they're talking about stopping the crime, but the crime is already advanced, so you know I don't think they could do too much. They could do something, but they can't stop all the shootings. They're not around too much. They need to patrol more. I think they use a little bit more violence than is necessary most of the time. And I don't think that they have any kind of respect for anybody. So I mean, why do you think there's so much police brutality? Because of the hostility level. See, like, like when we was out at the mall one day, you know, it was just a little thing. Practically because I didn't even do whatever they said we did, but the, level, the hostility level got, to, got so high 
to where they got to stepping on us and things like that, you know, and they got to just like beating on my boys and stuff like they was crazy and, you know, they got to tripping and flipping and all that, you know. So it wasn't nothing done about that, right? It just happened, right? Not yet, anyway, no. It's just been done. What's done has been said. So do you think that the police's actions are because of previous things that might have happened to them earlier that day or earlier that, that week or something like that that might make such a little thing like what they did to you, because I know, mm -hmm. go off like that? Or do it, you think there's another reason behind it? I believe it's, it could be something like that because, you know, they go through a lot of things during the day, you know, they see a lot of stuff happening. But you know, they gotta learn, they supposed to be policemen. They gotta learn how to keep their anger un under control. They can't take it out on somebody else, you know? Well, one of, one of the reasons why I believe there's police brutality, a lot of it is that, I mean, personally in my community, um, there's, you know, maybe cops that aren't even from my community. I myself believe that cops that patrol my area should be from my area, know something about where they're, about the place they're patrolling. But a lot of the cops that come to my neighborhood, you know, and are sweating the brothers and sisters in, in the hood or whatever, you know, are, d d have an ignorance or a misconception of who we are right. and what we're doing, you know. Right. And I believe that they should have some, <laughs> at, some type of understanding of, you know, who we are, know us a little, you know. Okay. Well, we have some police here with us, so let's ask them. I think that some of the things you're saying, all, everything that you said so far is, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think it's important that we look at police brutality on two levels, one of which is the, the reality of police brutality and the perception of police brutality. The reality is that it actually exists. And I think there's a, a couple reasons why that occurs. Um, one of which could be, as you said before, hostility. It could be prejudice or racism. It could be um, not being able to deal with stress and that type of stuff. And the reality is, is that particular individuals are um, expressing their hostility on people. The, um, the perception of it might be how you might perceive what the police are doing and that, in fact, um, it's not actually brutality um, but just a misinterpretation of what's going on. So there's two different things, and I think we need to sometimes take that into consideration and, and deal with the two individual um, things that are occurring and not try and collectively uh, base it all on one perception. Well, check, see, police, there should be, I must say, more programs where the police are on a, uh, on, a friend, on a friendly basis with the people, you know, get in touch with they, who they, you know, who they're supposed to protect and serve, right? Like, you know, like they should have like um, maybe a, an environment where police are around where you can get to know them. Because I know there's a lot of nice police officers out there, you know, that you can get to know on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And, you know, once you really feel, once you really know how they feel and how you feel, you can, you know, that's how you avoid problems, you know. Well, I don't need to cut you off, but since we're dealing with uh, misconceptions, you know, we don't always know what's in a cop's head when, when, when things go down, just like they don't know what's in ours. So, um, you know, I was wondering, you know, it's like, okay, the police are, are supposedly supposed to protect and to serve, you know, therefore that, that's your job, but who's, who's out there, you know, what goes down, who's protecting us from the police? And I'm not saying, uh, now, now granted, all police aren't bad. You know, I know cops that I've known for, since, I, since I was little. So, you know, what, what goes on, you know, how are police kept accountable for yeah. their actions? One thing, <clears throat> the city of Minneapolis has a severe review board. And uh, the community cried out for that, and that's what they have in place now. We have internal affairs. And people don't have much faith in our internal affairs system. So that's who is policing the police department. I don't know if, as a community, are we happy about that or not? But you also got to go back to what this young lady said here. Most of these police officers in our city doesn't live in Minneapolis. You know, myself and Donnie, we live in Minneapolis. I grew up on the north side. He's a south sider. You know, and we still live in our same neighborhoods. So that's that's a big problem there. Like you said, we don't sit and try to get to know each other and as individuals. And you know, most of the guys come out from the suburbs, and we like to call them mercenaries. They come out just come in the city kick butt, do whatever you want to do. And that's a small percentage. That's not everybody on that police department because we've got guys who live out there are very good police officers. So we have to look at that, too. Um, since we are talking about justice, what, how are you dealt with as black men on the police, to, on the police force? Well, that's a good, I don't know if, we can, if that can be answered as a quick question because we could, we could probably do a whole show right. on that. <laughs> and it's done an, right. a, a total uh, evolution and we still got a long ways to go. Um, I think initially when we first started out, it was it was just trying to be, try to do our job, try and be accepted 
period, as, as being um, at the same level and the same quality of officers as everybody else. Now it's evolved to where uh, we know and everyone knows that we're qualified and, and sometimes overly qualified and we want our just do. We want to be able to, um, to be able to, to have administrative powers, managerial powers within our police department, patrol our neighborhoods, have control over our own people, just as all of you do in your own lives. So it's gone from just being accepted to being that, hey, we need to be put in positions where that we can be in control of the destiny of the police department, the destiny of the city, and if we are allowed to do those things, then some of the problems that, uh, that, we're, that are occurring right now, some of the fallout that we're having probably will not happen if we have control of our own destiny as people. Check this out. The Ghetto Boys video, Crooked Officer, is a common hip-hop perception of the police. Here it's introduced by Rap A Lot Records President James Smith. This video is about crooked officers. We have no problem with uh, officers who do their job. Uh, it's not all cops we have a problem with. It's the cops that, uh, that make it bad for the good police officers. I'm sick of these fools trying to run mine. I'm coming with the gun line, running up the one time. I got a grudge against you, blue suits, black suits, white suits, and state troops. That's the way you made us. Send a brother to the penitentiary as I have played us. Locked us up for the summer. Took the brother's name away and passed his ass a number. Just because you literally packed a get, man, doesn't necessarily mean you have to point it at the black man. You let your cats pop, especially your black cops. Cause them devils got you brainwashed So now we come to New Dillons Forget all the nonsense The line of work is cap billings Ain't no billing not report Cause I'm cutting it short uh, And you ain't making it to court I'm letting freedom ring From the hole in my Glock For what you did to Rodney King And it ain't nothing you can ask us And since justice is blind I'ma buy the girl some glasses I'm pulling on the up chunks And coming after your badge Crooked officer, Mr. Officer, crooked officer. Why you wanna put me in the coffin, sir? See, I've been living in this neighborhood for too long. For you to try to change things and run me from my home. Mr. Officer, crooked officer. Why you wanna put me in the coffin, sir? See, you've been messing with brothers like myself for too long. Why don't you drop your pistol and your badge? Let's get it on. Mr. Officer, crooked officer, what's happening? You beat another black man down and now you hide, capping friend. Do I have to move to River of Oaks or bleach my skin so I can look like these white folks just to get some assistance because the brutality in my neighborhood is getting persistent because you want to harass me, yeah. And if I talk back, you ready to beat me down fast, G? Just like Rodney King. But if you try it with me, it's going to be a different scene. Try to pull me over on the dark road. Tell me to reach for my license so you can let your nine explode until my white shirt turns red from your lead. Because you like to see my blood shed. And I know you want to put me in the car Officer, but put your bill ain't going out like that. Mr. Officer, cook it off for sup. Why you wanna put me in the coffin, sir? See, I've been living in this neighborhood for too long. For you to try to change things and run me from my home. Mr. Officer, cook it off for sup. Why you wanna put me in the coffin, sir? See, you've been messing with brothers like myself for too long. It's time to drop your pistol and your badge. Let's get it Mama on. Mama called me up the other day. I got a warrant. Seems the police wanna know where the gun went. Said I shot somebody the other day at a party. I knew they was lying. I was at home drinking 40s. Cooling with my boys playing dominoes in the kitchen. The big black brother did the killing. And I'm fitting the description, yeah. And you know they think I'm black. People look alike. So now they got the flashlight looking for Big Mike, jacking brothers up, trying to capture me. Cowboys want to gap for me, trying to put bullets into the back of me. Time and time again, I told them I didn't do it, and they knew it, but they still pursued it. So I guess they blew it. So now they want to grab their guns and straight put me six feet under, because they never been able to stand a real brother. Turning tables, because I'm able, I ain't falling victim. Time to play a game, see the police watch me trick them, because I ain't running from the P-O-L-I-C-E. Now another T-I-M-E, they gon' have the G-E-T in me. Off the SCT and my A's up below D. Messing around with the B-I-G, they gotta be B-R-A-V-E. Mr. Officer, crooked officer. 
why you want to put me in the call for some see i've been living in this neighborhood for two that was the ghetto boys perception of police so eddie what's yours um well like high perceived cops uh i don't know really it's like they i mean they got to do their job but i mean they got to know how to use like the real police force i mean as know how to go about doing things instead of got to take a billy club and beat you know yeah, beat brothers down that, you know that's why i asked the question you know who who polices the police you know i think right. and because i've had my own my own situations with the police and i i think a lot of times officers they think well I, i'm not gonna be reprimanded for this you know it's i can get away with it a lot of times and that's why I asked, you know, we, we, we see that video, you know, a lot of these men are out here, you know, just, they get out there and they're just clubbing, just clubbing yeah. away because they know really, hey, you know, I can say it was in the line of duty, you know, I got these other people to back up my story, so I think, there, you know, there's a perception too. My perception of the police is, hey, I respect you as men, but, you know, truthfully, I cannot respect the institution in which you work because of the things that you, that, that I've seen go on and the things that have happened to me. I think that, um, Sometimes it seems like, you know, in, in, the, in the community that there's, there's two forms of communication going on. You know, like the sister said about the people coming from different communities coming in here doing a job as a police officer, but not knowing what's really going on in the community. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like the clothes we wear. I mean, I blame the media also. You know what I'm saying? The media, the media plays it out to the fullest. You know what I'm saying? And it's like... Uh, They'll see some things, you know, and you always hear it on the news, it's gang related, it's gang related. When it ain't, there's gangs up here, but come on, man. Most of the people up here that's in gangs are not committing crimes. They just in a gang. You know, there's gangsters at work, you know, and there's gangsters that have children. But they make it seem like everybody that's committing crimes is in a gang, you know. But that's their communication of what they see. You know what I'm saying? Like when there was a shooting at the mall, you know, they described these people as having on, you know, Chicago Bulls jackets. You know what I'm yeah. saying? All of a sudden they're yeah. in a gang. You know what I'm saying? We're on the street, you know, and and we standing on our corner on our block and they flash a light on you like, what's going on? We're offended, you know what I'm saying? Because we're in front of our house, you know, so we might say something like, man, what's all that for? You know what I'm saying? All of a sudden, there's two languages going on here, you know what I'm saying? They might feel like you're saying something to them that they don't like and you feel like they're saying something to you that you don't like. So, you know what I'm saying? If there's two forms of communication, you ain't going to never get nothing accomplished, you know? And that's how it gets played out. Like when the brothers was at the mall, it was two forms of of, of uh, communication going on there. You know, the brothers was out here like, we chilling, we having fun, you know, we ain't doing nothing, you know what I'm saying? And they sitting out here like, you know, well, don't get loud, you know, and cool out, you know, and next thing you know, they feel like they got a guy for you. I understand it's a job, but at the same time, you have to understand that there's culture involved, you know, and then that, that there's a, a, a high level of respect in the community, and it doesn't always show, but it does exist, you know, and and you know, people in the community do get offended very easily. You know what I'm saying? It's just a communication thing that starts it. And then after that, you know, I think if we start with that and realize that what we see is not always what's really going on, then it won't be so much of a, a, a pinpoint situation. We pinpoint all police as, you know, as dogs, and you know, police pinpoint all us as gang members and all that. You know what right. I'm saying? No, because so what, what, what do you policemen do to make sure that you know your communication and that your relationship is good with the community and those who you patrol and are supposed to be protecting and serving? I think one of the things that we do, and then I'd like to get back. I, as I, I know you've asked this question a couple of times, and I'd like to answer that for you. But one of the things I think that we do in, in opening and trying to maintain lines of communication is. One of the reasons why we're here today is because we're members of the Black Police Officers Association. And the Black Police Officers Association, in particular, is a community-oriented type thing. And that's, one of the, that's what we base our whole philosophy on. Initially, when we first started, it was as a support group and uh, for internal things that were going on. But as uh, problems exist within the, our communities, and because the majority of us come from the community in which we work in, we also main, we want to maintain those ties, you know, because when, you know, I'm not only a cop in Minneapolis, but I live in Minneapolis. The police in my city, you know, the, the police department that I work for also patrols and protects me. So I, you know, I buy into the police department because I buy into the community. And so that's one of the things that I do to, uh, to, to, to keep up the lines of communication. But if I could just answer your question, you said who polices the police? I'm glad you, you've asked that a couple times. Yeah, we have internal affairs. We have, um, 
we have um, civilian, civilian review, but more importantly, who polices the police? Society polices the police. And it goes back to one of the things that I was saying before, as far as, as, as we as people to be able to have a voice in our, in our police department, to have a voice in our government, to be a part of the administrative and the decision-making process. That in its of, of itself will help police what goes on internally. So I think that, you know, open up dialogue as far as this is concerned and for each and every one of us to not stop the fight to try and be a part of the police department and government at large is, 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 a, is a step. And what you were saying too is right on, you know, uh, the media buys into that. The media helps keep that struggle going and, and we can't let them continue it because if we do, then we're just, we're just as big of perpetrators in it as anybody else. So we've got to say, no, this isn't the, you know, this may be what you want to see, this is what you want to buy into, but the perception isn't the reality. And the reality is, is that everybody's not gangbangers. The, you know, the police and the, and, and the black community aren't always at odds. You know, we, we understand that we need the police in our communities to help protect us and our families, and that there's not this big you know, at each other's throat attitude day in and day out. But we also need to, and I'm going to throw this out to you, we need to have brothers and sisters on that police department. That was my job for over a year, recruitment. I hired the largest class of minorities ever in the history of Minneapolis and Minnesota. I hired 12 blacks in my class. You know, we used to average by one or two blacks. Hey, I throw that out to you. If you want to make a change, come on. Come on, be a part of the department. You know, like the video said, we get brainwashed. No, that's not right. Some people get brainwashed. And like we know, everybody who's who appears to be black ain't black all the time. And we know who they are. And we have those types on our department. Mm -hmm. well, would why you would you want to go out and be on the police force and you see stuff on TV every day, you know, that, you know, the, there's we see no justice, you know, and you see it out on the street. Why would you want to go out and stand up for something like do, that? Do you realize on a traffic stop, when you get pulled over, if there was a white cop and a black cop, that black cop might be stopping you from getting your head knocked in? Do we supposed to not be cops in our community and police our community and make sure our people are safe? and providing the service that they pay for. If we didn't have any black cops, you think you'll get that service? The community needs to demand that we know, and we have programs that through we get to know the officers that patrol our area. That's my main point. I need to know, because if I get pulled over, I feel like sometimes, oh, it's just a badge that I didn't get the number to, just, you know, I don't know a name. It's just a faceless person, you know, just can do anything they want. That's how I feel sometimes, but yet that's why I'm saying we need to stress, I mean, as people, as community, to get involved and know who these people are. That's and I I'm think saying. one of the points, that was an inter interesting fact, because I didn't know anyone would feel like that, that there should be more um, black police officers on the squad, because yes, it will stop you from getting your head beat in by getting pulled over, because there's a lot of unnecessary things that happen with these people who are coming from the suburbs, such as you said, who don't know anything about you, about me, about any of us. And that's why I think I, it needs to be stressed by the community. We take charge. Most people really don't know their rights. And like the brother said in the first part of this, uh, when a cop approaches you, you really don't know what's going on. And you don't know what things you can do, what things you can do. Just like on the video when he was like, they said, well, go for your your license or whatever, and you know, they can use that as an excuse to pop you one, you know what I'm saying? You really need to know our rights, and I just want to know if there's any way that we can find out, you know, just if you could tell us now, that'd be cool, you know, what our rights are, you know, when we're pulled over, what we could do, because I was just reading, you know, back in the 60s about Hugh P. Newton, how he used to patrol the police, you know, but, you know, they stopped him, but yet, you know, he knew all his rights and stuff, and so therefore he had the upper hand and the edge on the police, and they couldn't get him to do anything, and he almost got killed for that. You know? it, it depends on, as far as your rights are concerned, it depends on the circumstances, and you know, and we could you know, go on about that. But I guess just to kind of give you a thumbnail sketch of, you know, my best advice is, you know, if it's a stop, a traffic stop that you're talking about, you know, it, it takes a driver's license to, um, to drive, a, uh, drive a motor vehicle in the state of Minnesota, so therefore you have to produce a driver's license, that type of thing. I guess my, my, the best advice I can give is just, you know, as much as, much as possible, try and be polite and try and be cooperative, because the bottom line is, is that you can always debate this later in one of the other arenas that we were talking about or in court. But if something goes down and you get hurt or you get, you know, injured or killed, you know, then no one's going to bring that life back. And that's what I'm more important or more concerned about. So um, whatever it takes to get you through that situation um, is my best advice. <laughs>
1966, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale formed the Black Panther Party for self-defense to counter the brutality of the Oakland Police Department. They're heavily armed. Whether their weapons are loaded or not, nobody seems to know. The Panthers were strapped. Using their constitutional right to bear arms, they carried guns and law books as they monitored police activity in the black community. The party's message of self-defense and revolutionary political change spread throughout the country as local branches opened across the nation. In the early 70s, the Panthers stressed community-based efforts like free food programs, free medical clinics, and even a community school. The Black Panther Party was born out of a reaction to police brutality, but the movement developed into a broad-based organization, leaving a legacy of self-reliance, pride, proactive politics, and power. A legacy seen in hip-hop artists today like Public Enemy and Paris. Still growing, the power so strong, you can't stop it now. Regardless what the media says, people are harassed by cops every day and don't know what to do about it. My man Keith is committed to dropping knowledge on the community about what they can do to protect themselves. Keith, given a situation where you're walking and driving down the street, what rights do you have? Well, that's a good question, and to help y'all answer it, I brought a few gifts for you. Nah. <laughs> Some gifts. Some don't believe the hype. You know, I gotta bring presents <laughs> when I come. <laughs> the, uh, that pamphlet I just handed you is a pamphlet that we developed at the Legal Rights Center to help tell you what to do when you're stopped by the police. The first thing you need to do when you're stopped by the police is to be calm. That's not a law, that's just common sense. You've got to be calm because if you're acting out, and even if the police officer is wrong and you're acting out, what will happen is that you can be charged with disorderly conduct, obstructing legal process, and all kinds of things. So you've got to be calm. After you get calm, you've got to remember you have a right to remain silent. A lot of people violate that rule. Shut up about your case. Now, you might have to identify yourself, who you are, but you don't get to run, need to run on about whether you did it or whether you didn't do it. You just shut up. Because if you, even if you didn't do it, it's good to have a lawyer there to help you discuss whether you need to make a statement or not. The third rule that you need to observe is whether or not you need to show ID. If you're on the street, there is no law that says you have to have identification. There's no law that says you have to do that, so you wouldn't be violating the law if you walk down the street and the police says show ID and you don't do it. If you're in a car, you would be. You must show your ID. There's a crime, no driver's license, no DL. You've got to keep that on your person. So keep that on your person at all times. When a police officer stops you in a car, the best thing to do is to remain in your seat, to keep your hands on the wheel, and wait till that officer, he or she, asks you something. If they ask you to see your ID, you should show it. If they ask you where you're coming from, you should politely say, your officer, if you have a stop, uh, be reason to stop me, you should cite me. But if they want to know where you're going, where you're coming from, and all that kind of stuff, that's not a question you have to answer. And uh, oftentimes, if you, talk, if you begin to talk like that, those statements may be introduced against you. You should not be rude to that officer. The other officers who were here were very important, very uh, wise in telling you not to be, be impolite, because that in itself could bring a whole lot of trouble. But you don't want to get into a lot of extended dialogue when a police officer stops you, because you don't know what statements will be used against you at a later time. Well, what happens if you ask, I mean, there, you're asked a question that you don't want to answer, and you don't answer it, and they, they get offended. They get offended. Right. Can you give me an example of what kind of question? I have one. Well, um, what you uh, oh, well, go ahead if you go want. Ahead. Like you just said, you got to have a lawyer present, you know, before you make a statement. Say they ask you, uh, what, what, what were you doing around there? Um, did you do it? Are you, are you one? You, you know, you, you know, no, I'm not the one. You know, why are you doing this to me? But, but then you're supposed to be quiet. And if you be quiet, then, well, that's we're offending the police officers, you know what I'm saying? Well, let me tell you. Some police officers are so accustomed to pushing people around, some of them, uh, that nothing you do is going to please them, right? 
So you can't, you got to get out of the business of worrying about whether you're going to please the officer or not. That's what you've got to do is look out for yourself. And the best way to do that is to say, officer, here's my license. And he starts saying to where you going, what are you doing here? Say, officer, if you're going to cite me, cite me. But if you want to ask me questions, I would like to have a lawyer present. And right at that point, the officer should not ask you any more questions. Some will, but you keep talking about you want your lawyer there. Plead the fifth. Now you can, you can, you you can, and you should identify who you are, right? But when the questions start flowing, you have a right to talk to the lawyer before you uh, start giving any answers like that. Now I want y'all to know that in the case of a driving while intoxicated case, the rules are a little are basically the same, but it can get to a little be get to be a little more complicated. In that situation, you still have a right to talk to an attorney before uh, you go into, uh, uh, you start asking a bunch of questions. The law has changed now, and it says that if, the off if they say you, you know, if they offer to give you some test uh, to dis test whether you've been drinking alcohol or not, it's a crime not to take the test. But you still have a right to talk to an attorney before you begin answering any questions. And you should insist on that because officers a lot of times know that you're scared of them. They know that you don't know what your rights are. They know all these things. But if you can remember, you have a right to have an attorney before you answer any questions other than simple identification questions, you'll be a lot safer in the long run. Uh, how, about this? how about this, though? You know, because for the most part, I am aware of, of my basic rights. But I, I'd like to know what happens when, when you ask that cop for his badge number, or you're trying to get a, you know, look around and see a car number and, you know, they don't want to be forthcoming with you, then where are your rights? Well, the truth is, is that what does a right mean? A right means you have recourse, you have recourse. A lot of times your recourse is later, is in the courtroom. Now, if it's an officer is violating the law, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. I would not suggest that you take that officer on right there in the middle of the street late at night, just you and him and his, right. and his partner. But you do have a right to say, officer, what am I being stopped for? I'd like an officer supposed to tell you what you're being stopped for, because they, because police officials who develop police policy know that you, it's people will get angry if you they don't know why they're being stopped. So they're supposed to do that. You have a right to ask them that. What you should do is just say, officer, I want your license, number, the license of your badge. I mean, the badge number. And if they say I'm not giving it to you, you should leave it right there. But you should try to remember every single thing about that officer you can, and you should write it down just as soon as after it happens so that your memory can be fresh. Documenting things is very important when the police abuse you or insult you or brutalize you. Well, thank you. If you need some more information about your basic rights, then here's a number you can call, 871-4888. If you missed the number, it's 871-4888. As long as we don't have proper education, there'll never really be a true juvenile uh, justice system. If you teach somebody about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln first and not their selves first, you're going to have a massive juvenile problem. Massive. And this is what we have today. My question is, how can we make the system accountable to us? And how can we make us accountable for each other? And I throw that to Keith. Well, uh, the only way to really do it is get out there in the streets and uh, force it to happen. All social change that has happened in this century has been because people, you, a lot of times black folks, have gotten out there and marched to end segregation and marched to stop the Vietnam War, have marched to bring about civilian view in Minneapolis, and have gotten together. The thing to do was to agitate, 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 no struggle, no progress. I think another way is, um you know, we hear about it a lot, but we need to get out here and vote. You know, regardless of what community of color that we are in, we will not get justice unless we get out here and vote to hold the people we put in office accountable. But also, we don't get on juries if we're not registered to vote. That's how, that's how they pick juries. You know, so if we're not registered, then, we, you know, it's like, hey, that's just another way that we're missing out on our justice right there. One of the points that I think was interesting and important that you brought up is that the people get out and agitate. That's one of the things my just I just keep stressing this. It's all about community to me because going back to all the things that we've talked about in the first segment, police brutality, what have you, um, black on black crime, one of the ma main reasons for things that go on such as crime is I think where I live there's four 
um, there's these businesses, liquor stores and things. We need to get out and boycott these, these businesses, get them out of our neighborhood if we do not want them there. And we also, like he said, need to register to vote. If we want justice, we have to get it. You know, I think the key thing is knowledge, right? Because without knowledge, there's ignorance, right? And, and without not knowing the true facts, there's always going to be ignorance. Ignorance. There's always going to be that period. But, you know, what solution, this is, we're trying to find a solution. We can go out and teach brothers as a whole, you know. You know, I mean, I look at TV and the things are, the things that come on, don't do drugs. I mean, you know, people just flip. I've seen this before. Don't do this. Don't do this. Why don't do that, you know? How, I mean, come on, you know, we, it's, it's just society period man just ticks me off everybody's trying to make a little slogan baby. yeah you know like like you were saying if it wasn't for tv i don't think half of us would know what well we would know what violence is but half of us wouldn't know all about all these drugs and stuff that's out here you there know? you go man they, they try to they try to they try to address the situations like you know say no to drugs you know and all that these people probably have never been to the community actually seen a crackhead, you know what I'm saying? Right. We, you know, most of us, if not all, we see them every day, right. you know what I'm saying? We see the people who sell it, we see the people who smoke it. And we sometimes even know these people, you know what I'm yes. saying? So we know what's behind why they do what they do. And that's what people need to find out, why people do what they do. Just he's a junkie, he's a crackhead, he's a gangbanger. You know, we tired of all that. We tired of getting labeled, you know what I'm saying? And another thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, when you see stuff like little flyers on your doorstep about a community meeting on your block and stuff, okay. check them out at least once, you know what I'm saying? You know, I've thought about it. I never did it, you know, but I'm going to do it because, you know, I got a daughter, you know, and I'm accountable for my daughter, you know. When she come in the neighborhood, I got to look out for her, you know, and I want everybody else to look out for her too. So, you know, yeah. it's a start, you know what I'm saying? Hey. Togetherness is another key, you know. If we're all together and we're all united, you know, there's no stopping us. You know, we can go as far as we want, all right? right. And it, we're sitting there, we, I'm, we're stuck, you know. I'm, we're stumped. We need to get together and keep keep on, look forward. Don't go backwards, you know. Don't go right. sideways. The key is forward, you know. Go on. And that's what we need to do. Think about that. Yeah. Knowledge again. Community. Keep going. Fighting for justice in the pages of comic books has usually been the job for characters from mainstream America. But the new Milestone comics are the product of a group of brothers, writers and artists of color who wanted to create a universe filled with heroes of color. Characters like Hardware, Static, The Blood Syndicate, and Icon. They fight for truth, justice, and the African American way. But there are some everyday people in the Twin Cities who are working to help heal our community. Ron Baer is the director of the American Indian Movement's AIM Patrol. We go on patrol like every night, you know, on weekends we have cars, during the week we have cars. We've been uh, helping the police quite a bit, you know, we uh, had a few of our patrols that also got awards for uh, making a citizen arrest on uh, people that have been breaking into businesses. Uh, there was one male that uh, a couple of our youths also helped catch. It was a rape. They raped someone by the Indian Health Board, and they helped catch them. Ever since we started working with the youth, there's a lot of the youth that gave up the drinking, gave up the drugs, they gave up the gangs, and they went back to school and they helped their education. So in the meantime, we probably right now we probably got almost close to 130, 140 youth involved with the patrol. Working with AM Patrol allows teens to protect and serve their own hood. It's helping our people. I mean, we're keeping them from getting beat up all the time, keeping them from using drugs or getting drunk all the time. And just gives me a lot of things to do instead of being on the streets. Yeah, I got a lot of little sisters and my mom, and I just want to make sure that there's the best for them. Help 
this on the way. Took him to the hospital. So he's okay. You know, so copy. We are one at Winnipeg, Manitoba. We started the patrol up there. We started a patrol in South Dakota. Uh, Saskatchewan wants us to come up there, start a patrol. We start one in Wisconsin. So a lot of people come here, they see uh, what we're doing, and then they invite us to their different communities, their countries, and everything like that, and uh, start a patrol there. Because I'm the black man going to get my people out this ghetto land. I'm going to put down the weapon and use my brain. Inner cities across America are producing new young leaders, and many are organizing peace treaties between rival gangs. In early May, over 100 leaders and former members of street organizations from 26 cities met in Kansas City for a peace and justice summit. We thank you for waking us up and giving us a new consciousness. Lord, we confess that many of us have been asleep while we were walking. Stop the violence, get together, knowledge. stay in school, gang bang is not cool. Peace movement with us is working. 100%. It's in effect a year in today in LA in the Watts area. There's peace going on all over this country. We've been out for four years, since 1989 in Boston. And we have saved, and brothers have saved each other's lives again and again and again. We come here for peace. We're tired of seeing our mothers at the graveyard. I personally have lost two brothers, seven relatives, 20 relatives to the penitentiary right now. And I am tired. And I've come here as a peacemaker. I came here for us to say to our people, we are about love, peace, freedom, and justice, and economic parity. That's what I came here for. Ben Chavez, the new head of the NAACP, threw his weight behind this new urban peace movement. The initiative that was taken to get a truce in LA, to get a truce in Chicago, to get a truce in Minneapolis, to get a truce in Boston, in Washington and other places, is holding. And that's why we're here, to expand the truce. The summit also focused on economic development, police accountability, and unity among people of color. The fight is not between the black and the brown. It's not a fight between us. We have to come be able to search deeper inside of us how to be able to find the answers, yeah. because the answers is with us. We are not the problem. Yeah. We are the solution. Yeah. Let's show them our new pizza. These kind of efforts help create and maintain public safety, peace, and unity in the community. is know your rights and if you don't know them learn them and also remember to know yourself we out of here peace sign 1993 gotta go gotta go it's a unity thing much love for my people here but what good is love if the people don't really care the triggers are cold at the old okay cake corral but it ain't no okay when my people live foul another sad case of the black on black it's a fact some of our people don't know how to act can't go to the club can't go to the store can't chill with your girl can't go to the show can't do anything without some fool acting up you start to believe that black folk are savage but before you do allow me to say that in the old days we didn't act that way see kings and queens were the names of the righteous but the sons of slaves are insane and we might just self-destruct and erupt without a chance to grow this ain't the days of old Great.
So I say, what will it take before we change up? Some more of us dead, or more of us locked up, or maybe even more of us will blame the white man before we understand now the problem's not him. What I'm telling you is actual fact I ain't pro-human cause all humans ain't pro-black Remember in your mind that there still exists A plan to bring down a black fist See the struggle is uphill Life's at a standstill Jackpot Jill, now we don't act real And every living moment got us singing the blues A sole provider can't afford the baby shoes That's the cycle so many of us go through America's black holocaust continues And I just hope we wake up soon before we fold I miss the days of old. Funding for this Community Affairs Unit production was provided by the McKnight Foundation, responding to the needs of individuals and communities, Grand Metropolitan Food Sector Foundation on behalf of the Pillsbury Company, the Northwest Area Foundation, and the James R. Thorpe Foundation. Additional support to the Don't Believe the Hype project was provided by the undesignated funds of the Minneapolis Foundation and the Minnesota Office of Drug Policy.